Good evening. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee of the ICE for inviting me to this meet expert session to talk about this very important topic, which is the long-term follow-up of patients with thyroid cancer. I have no conflict of interest regarding this presentation. So the aim of the follow-up of patients with differentiated thyroid cancer is to identificate actionable recurrent or persistent disease at an appropriate time. The follow-up strategies should be tailored to the specific risk estimates of recurrent or persistent disease. It should be updated in every evaluation according to response to therapy. And it is very important also to consider the economical and psychological cost of uh, the follow-up. So we should balance this cost with the likelihood of finding a uh, recurrent disease. I would like to start this presentation with a clinical case. This is a 46 year old male who had a total thyroidectomy plus a central and lateral cervical neck dissection. The pathology report showed a classic papillary thyroid carcinoma of two centimeters. He had 15 leaf node metastases, 15 millimeter, the largest of them, with no extra nodal extension. Patient received 100 milligree radioactive iodine and the whole body scan post therapy showed no suspicious finding. Also, a CT scan of the lung without uh, contrast did not show any suspicious uh, nodules in the lung. At an evaluation one year later, using levothyroxine and with, with a TSH of 0.2, the second generation thyroglobulin showed uh, undetectable thyroglobulin and also there were no presence of thyroglobulin antibodies. Neck ultrasound was negative. So I would like to ask you, what should be the next step in his follow-up? And you could answer with uh, clicking in the, uh, in the alternative that you think could be the right one. A, he, we should perform a diagnostic whole body scan and a stimulated thyroglobulin. B, we should perform only a stimulated thyroglobulin. C, we should follow this patient at six to 12 months with TSH, thyroglobulin using levothyroxine, that means non-stimulated, thyroglobulin antibodies and neck ultrasound, and D, follow the patient at six to 12 months with the same biochemical assess, but in this, in this alternative, we could defer the neck ultrasound to every two to five years if the thyroglobulin remains low. So please answer which of the four alternative you think is the right way to, uh, or the right next step uh, in the follow-up of this patient. We will discuss this case at the end of the presentation. So regarding the same case, what is the further risk of recurrence of this patient after this evaluation one year later? Is the risk of recurrence less than 3%? A. B, it is between 5 to 20%. And C, is it more than 40%? So you could answer now, and we will discuss at the end of the presentation. So in order to build up a good strategy uh, to follow a patient with differentiated thyroid cancer, we have to classify them in what is the risk of recurrence. One of the most used uh, uh, categories to uh, classify the patient is the one that was published by the ATA in 2015. They divided the patient in low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. You could find this table in this publication. This table tried to make it more easily to understand uh, the risk of recurrence. For patients with papillary thyroid cancer, the characteristic that we uh, will use to classify the patient is uh, 
if they have extra thyroid extension or not, and if they have it, if it is microscopic or macroscopic, if they had lymph node metastasis, and if they have them, what is the number and the size? The larger the size and the larger the number, the higher the risk. Also, we have to know if the patient have distant metastasis, if they have them, they are high risk. We have to know what is the histology. Uh, if it is classical, it's low risk. And if we have aggressive histology, the patient is at an intermediate risk. And also if there is, a, a, if, if there is present or absence of vascular invasion. And vascular invasion means uh, blood uh, vas uh, vascularity and not lymph node uh, vessels. On the other hand, follicular thyrocarcinoma are classified as low risk or high, high, high risk depending, of, uh, depending if they have minimally invasive or widely invasive characteristic. And if they have vascular invasion, uh, we, we will classify them as low risk or high risk depending on the number of vascular invasion fossils. So in every patient with thyroid cancer, we will use thyroglobulin, thyroglobulin antibodies, and neck ultrasound in all of them. And we will use another tools in some specific case that we will discuss later. Neck ultrasound had to be done by experimented professional. We I proposed uh, the, scheme that, the scheme that was proposed also by the ETA 2013 guidelines, which divided the, the neck ultrasound findings in normal, indeterminate, or suspicious. Suspicious were classified if the lymph node had one or more of the following characteristics. The presence of microcalcification, the presence of a partially cystic appearance, presence of tissue-like, uh, thyroid tissue-like appearance, and or the presence of peripheral vascularization. On the other hand, we, we call an indeterminate uh, lymph node if they have no ileum plus one or more of the following characteristic, round tape, increased toward aces, or increased central vascularization. On the other hand, normal lymph nodes are the one that did not have any of the characteristics that I uh, said before. Talking about thyroglobulin, it is important to uh, measure it in a reliable laboratory. We have to measure at the same times always thyroglobulin antibodies and we have to measure the thyroglobulin always with the same technique and ideally in the same lab. This is because in that way, we can calculate the trend of thyroglobulin and the double time of the thyroglobulin if, the, if it is increasing. There are a very uh, elegant paper, and one of these was of Miyauchi, that showed that patients in which the thyroglobulin increased uh, faster, that means that the double time is shorter, the likelihood of having distant metastasis or local regional uh, recurrence is higher in, compar in comparison with patients who had longer for a uh, double time or patients in which uh, the thyroglobulin is stable as this bottom line here. If thyroglobulin is stable, the likelihood of having persistent recurrent disease is very low. Thyroglobulin, nowadays, with the information that have can, we know that it could be uh, measured non-stimulated using level thyroxine. Before, with the older techniques of thyroglobulin, we knew that patients who have thyroglobin less than one, we could not know patients who had mildly elevated thyroglobulin levels. So at that time, 
we used to do um, a stimulation with either recombinant human TSH or thyronormal hormone uh, withdrawal in order to find these patients who has little value of thyroglobulin, in which case they increased and became detectable. Nowadays, as we showed here on the right hand, thyroglobulin, second generation thyroglobulin, also talked or called as highly sensitive thyroglobulin, can be measured as low as 0.1 nanogram per ml. So at the difference to the older assay, we can identify patients who has this low level of thyroglobulin, making a stimulation non-useful. -use, this second generation or highly sensitive thyroglobulin assays is as a cost that is very similar to the older thyroglobulin assays. And also each year is being available in more and more public and private center. There are different studies, and this is a very elegant study of Spencer that showed that there is a very good correlation between this uh, new thyroglobulin and the older one. And also there is a very good correlation between the basal thyroglobulin and the stimulated thyroglobulin. There are also several studies that had shown that undetectable thyroglobulin um, with this new generation are, has a very high negative predictive value. Different studies have shown that the cutoff that combine the best sensitivity and specificity to find recurrent disease is around 0.2 nanogram per ml. Therefore, nowadays we know that using this second generation thyroglobulin on levothyroxine, when, this, when the value of them is below 0, 0.2 nanogram per ml, plus negative thyroglobulin antibodies, plus negative ultrasound, the negative predictive value of having persistent or recurrent disease is more than 98%. So we can conclude that second generation thyroglobulin using levothyroxine in most of the cases is enough to make um, uh, a confidable uh, follow-up and to rule out persistent disease. So it is important to know that any time that we make the follow-up of the patient and that we measure thyroglobulin, we have to measure also thyroglobulin antibodies. Why? Because it has an um, prevalence of 8 to 36 percent, it can induce falsely low value of thyroglobulin when we use uh, chemiluminescence assess of thyroglobulin, or it can give us falsely high level of thyroglobulin when we measure it with radio, uh, sorry, with uh, radio immunos, uh, immunoassess. It is important to know that thyroglobulin antibodies should be measured with the same techniques and also in the same lab. And this is because the thyroglobulin antibody strength is a very good surrogate uh, of thyroglobulin when they are present. And it's more relevant than just the presence of thyroglobulin antibodies. This is also a very um, elegant uh, paper of Karen Spencer where she uh, showed the importance of the trend. When patients have thyroglobulin antibodies, more than 75% of the patient will have a decrease of more than 50% of the initial value. And in these cases, the likelihood of having persistent disease is less than 3%. 35% of this patient will become negative at a median of time of four years. A stable uh, trend of thyroglobulin will be found in 18% of the patient, and the likelihood of recurrence in this patient is around 
only 7% of the patient will have an increase in the thyroglobulin antibodies levels. And in their case, the likelihood of having recurrent or persistent disease is around 40%. Also, it is important to know that even though any level of thyroglobulin antibodies could interfere or make interference with thyroglobulin measurement, mildly elevated level of thyroglobulin are less likely to make an interference or an important interference. And this was also shown uh, by this interesting paper where they showed when, that when the thyroglobulin antibodies are mildly elevated below the manufactured cutoff level, the likelihood of having any interference is very low. So it is important to know which thyroglobulin antibodies we are using in our lab and what is the uh, level of uh, detection, which is similar to the analytical sensitivity, and also what is the level of cutoff for the manufacturer. Con in conclusion, the management of patients who have thyroglobulin antibodies will depend on the uh, thyroglobulin antibodies levels, on the thyroglobulin antibodies trend, on the initial risk of recurrence of the patient uh, is different a very low risk patient who has mildly elevated thyroglobin antibodies than a high risk patient in which we should be more afraid of the meaning of these thyroglobin antibodies. And also it is important to know the initial treatment performed. Patients who had only lobectomy are less likely to have a decrease in their antibodies uh, comparing with patients who had total thyroidectomy. Another um, uh, interference that could uh, happen, but in a very low number of patients, is the heterophilic antibodies. When we have to suspect them, when we have an appropriately high thyroglobinin levels, that does not match with the clinical scenario or the risk of recurrence of the particular patient. And there are different ways to rule out or to understand if we are in front of these antibodies interfering with our techniques. Other imaging will be done rarely and some indication of making them are the following. We could use thoracic, thoracic or neck CT scan in patients with high risk of recurrence and in some patients with intermediate risk of, the, of recurrence. Fluor deoxyglucose PET CT scan should be done in some high risk patient or in patients who have increasing thyroglobulin or thyroglobulin antibodies and in which this increase is relevant. Regarding the diagnostic whole body scan that used to be performed in most of patients with thyroid cancer in uh, previously in the last uh, in the previous decades we know that now that they should be rarely indicated nowadays why because they has a very low sensitivity to find any structural disease in which case we could think on performing this uh, diagnostic whole body scan. In some patients with intermediate or high risk of recurrence, when, for example, they have some suspicious finding in the post-therapy whole body scan after radioactive iodine treatment, or in patients in which we have increasing, significantly increasing levels of thyroglobulin or thyroglobulin antibodies in the follow-up, and also we could consider to use the, it in some patients who had intermediate or high risk of recurrence, who were treatment, treated with radioactive iodine and in which there is incomplete or indeterminate response to therapy and who had a star effect of the whole body scan post-therapy 
that could interfere in the imaging of some suspicious findings in the lateral neck or mediastinum or in the lungs. So after this initial uh, evaluation, we had to uh, update the risk of recurrence of the patient using an evaluation that should be performed six to 18 months after the initial therapy. We had to use thyroglobulin and thyroglobulin antibodies and imaging. Thyroglobulin, as I said before, using uh, levothyroxine with TSH between 0.5 and 2, and when the risk of recurrence is higher, lower TSH. And ideally with second generation thyroglobulin. The imaging we will uh, always use at that time ultrasound, and we can use, as I said before, other imaging depending on the risk of recurrence and other features of the case. The classification of the response to therapy will depend on the level of thyroglobulin, thyroglobulin antibodies, and the imaging. And the level of thyroglobulin and thyroglobulin antibodies will depend also to make the difference classification on what was the treatment that the patient received. If they received total thyroidectomy plus radioactive iodine, total thyroidectomy without radioactive iodine or lobectomy. We will classify the patient as excellent responder to therapy when ultrasound was negative, thyroglobulin was below 0.2 and thyroglobulin antibodies were negative in patients with total thyroidectomy with or without radioactive iodine treatment and thyroglobulin less than 30 when they had only lobectomy. We will call the patient with indeterminate response to therapy when they have undeterminate findings in the neck ultrasound or neck ultrasound that is negative, but with mildly elevated thyroglobulin levels. In the case of total thyroidectomy plus radioactive iodine, thyroglobulin between 0.2 and 1. When total thyroidectomy without RI, thyroglobulin between 0.2 and 5. Or any uh, level of thyroglobulin, as long as this is mildly elevated, but with thyroglobulin antibodies that is stable or decreasing. It means no increasing thyroglobulin antibodies. We will classify the patient as with an incomplete response to therapy if they have negative, incomplete, sorry, biochemical, incomplete biochemical response to therapy, if they have negative ultrasound, and in the case of total thyroidectomy plus iodine, thyroglobulin larger or higher than one, total thyroidectomy without radioactive iodine, thyroglobulin more than five, and in patients with lobectomy when they have thyroglobulin over 30. Or we, we will classify also as biochemical incomplete response when regardless of the th thyroglobulin levels, they have thyroglobulin antibodies that are increasing over the time. A structural incomplete response to therapy, we will, uh, will be all the patients who had suspicious imaging, regardless of the levels of thyroglobulin or thyroglobulin antibodies. So after this classification, six to 18 months after the initial therapy, we will update the long-term risk of recurrence or persistent disease, which will guide our further follow-up and what to do with the specific patient. Both low risk and intermediate risk of, uh, of, in, of patient at the initial time who had excellent or indeterminate response to therapy, that means negative ultrasound, thyroglobulin less than one, uh, or uh, undeterminate findings on the ultrasound has a long-term risk of recurrence that is less than 2%. And this is the large uh, amount of patients that we uh, used to see in our clinics. 
more than 70%. So it is very important to know this number. On the other hand, when the patient started to be a low risk patient of recurrence who had biochemical incomplete response to therapy, the risk of recurrence is 7%. And when we have intermediate risk of patient, risk of recurrent patient with biochemical incomplete response, the risk of recurrence is higher, 16%. When the patient has started being a high risk patient, if they have excellent response, their risk of recurrence is smaller, but it is still high, 14%. And if they have biochemical incomplete response, the risk of recurrence is larger, uh, almost 20%. Regardless of the initial risk of recurrence, if we have an st structural incomplete response, of course the patient is at that time uh, with structural disease. So they have 100% risk of long-term recurrence. I will focus now in this last algorithm on what to do with the low and intermediate risk patient who, as I said before, are the largest amount of patient that we see in our clinic. If they have an incomplete structural response, we have to uh, manage them case by case. If they have an incomplete biochemical response to therapy, their risk of recurrence is between 13 to 20%. And we should follow this patient with thyroglobulin every six to 12 months and to see what is the trend of the thyroglobulin. We have to use or to uh, make several and serial neck ultrasound and other imaging depending on the case. When we are uh, on the patient with excellent on in the, or indeterminate response to therapy, uh, in both cases, if they start to being low or intermediate risk, uh, we have to use this information to know how to follow them. As I said before, the recurrence, the risk of recurrence is very low, less than 2%. And if the recurrence happened, it used to be, it is uh, usually is before the five years and very rarely after that, but usually before the 10 years. On the other hand, we know that intermediate and low risk patient who has in the year follow-up negative ultrasound and thyroglobulin less than one on levothyroxine six to 12 months after the initial therapy, repeating neck ultrasound every one to two years discover only indeterminate findings that usually are false negative positive, increasing the anxiety of the patient and also of the doctors without a clear benefit to the patient. And that have been evaluated and found in different papers. So using this information, we can say that both group of patients, excellent and indeterminate response, should be followed every one to two years with physical examination, non-stimulated thyroglobulin, thyroglobulin antibodies, and TSH. And neck ultrasound can be considered in the patient with excellence response, but not before five years. Because, and even though at that time, it is not clear if we will have any, um, any uh, findings, any relevant findings. Later, we have to follow this patient with clinic, clinical examination, thyroglobulin, thyroglobulin antibodies, every one to two years, and no more neck ultrasound unless there is an increase in thyroglobulin or thyroglobulin antibodies. Also, before the five years, we can do neck ultrasound if we have increasing thyroglobulin or thyroglobulin antibodies. In the patients with indeterminate response to therapy, but without uh, indeterminate findings in the neck ultrasound, we also, if we uh, perform a neck ultrasound, should do that at five years 
usually if we do it before we will uh, it will not give us important or useful information and probably falsely positive findings but if the patients are called indeterminate responder because they have some indeterminate findings in the neck ultrasound in this case of course we have to perform an ultrasound uh, no later than five years and probably also we can consider to make ultrasound before the five years more neck ultrasound after five years is not clear if we have to uh, perform in this indeterminate responder patients but of course if we have increasing level of theroglobulin or increasing level of theroglobulin antibodies we have to repeat neck ultrasound uh, from this time uh, uh, further and probably uh, with an increasing frequency if the thyroglobin is or thyroglobin antibodies are increasing importantly also we have to consider other cross-sectional imaging depending on the case in the case of low risk patients who had at the initial treatment only lobectomy if they have an incomplete structural response found probably in the neck ultrasound, the management will depend case by case. On the other hand, if the patient have no structural disease, the proposed follow-up of this patient is to measure uh, thyroglobulin and thyroglobulin antibodies probably every 12 to 24 months. And probably the most important Think of the thyroglobulin and the antibodies is the is the trend. This patient should have TSH level before, between 0.5 and 2, and we probably will consider this patient who has the other log of thyroid uh, to uh, have a neck ultrasonography every three to five years after the initial treatment. I would like to thank. Uh, after this presentation, uh, our team of Clinica Alemana Universidad del Desarrollo, uh, we, uh, we have a very um, uh, important team of endocrinology, surgeon, radiologist, nuclear medicine doctor, and of course, our lovely nurse, which is a very important part of our team. I would like to thank you, your attention and I am open to uh, answer any question that you could have from this important topic. Thank you very much.